All right, good evening. I'd invite you to turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 4. We're going to pick up in the next chapter of this fantastic book. Martin Luther King Jr. had a dream. Nebuchadnezzar had too. We're going to look at his second dream tonight. That was a terrible introduction. I'm so sorry. (laughs) Daniel chapter 4. Let's read our text. We're going to look tonight at the first nine verses, and this really gets us started in Nebuchadnezzar's second dream. He begins Daniel chapter 4, verse 1, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, to all the peoples, nations, and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are his signs, how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and his dominion is from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. I saw a dream, and it made me fearful. And these fantasies as I lay on my bed and the visions in my mind kept alarming me. So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon, that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Then the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners came in, and I related the dream to them but they could not make its interpretation known to me. But finally, Daniel came in before me, whose name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is the spirit of the holy gods. And I related the dream to him, saying, O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream which I have seen, along with its interpretation." If we were to read the rest of the chapter, we'll just summarize it here for our time this evening. We would discover that Nebuchadnezzar's dream involved a great big tree, and it was a tree that was filled with bounty for all of the world to enjoy, and then that tree was destroyed down to its stump. The stump and the roots were left, but the tree was demolished. And then the scene changes a little bit. We are no longer dreaming about a tree, but about a beast And there will be an animal roaming the ground or a man roaming the grass like an animal for seven years. We find out that this very dream came to pass in Nebuchadnezzar's life merely a year later. And look down at verse 29. Twelve months later, he was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon The king reflected and said, Is this not Babylon the great, which I myself have built as a royal residence by the might of my power and for the glory of my majesty? And again, you're just wishing Nebuchadnezzar had not said those words. The dream, of course, was about Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar was the great tree, and Nebuchadnezzar was the man that acted beastly for seven years crazy. What we're looking at this morning is, or this evening, is the setup to the dream, its interpretation, and its fulfillment. And what we discover in the setup to this dream is that Nebuchadnezzar is eager and ready to exalt the God of Israel. Nebuchadnezzar here in the first part of Daniel 4 is doxological. He is ready to worship the one true God, and he does so by way of a doxological summary and by way of personal testimony. And as we look at this, I want to make a few preliminary observations. It's fascinating that this is the only chapter in our Bible penned by a pagan, written by a pagan king. And it may very well have been Daniel's pen that actually recorded this, but these are Nebuchadnezzar's words. This is Nebuchadnezzar's narration. This is his extolling people to worship God. And this is very much like chapter 2, the dream that we saw there, except that this one is given in first person. Nebuchadnezzar is giving a testimonial. And unlike the dream in chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar only requests the interpretation of the dream, not some miraculous disclosure of the dream itself. And in this chapter, unlike chapter 2, Daniel is known to Nebuchadnezzar 
as one who has the answers. There's a remarkable structure unfolding here in the book of Daniel. Daniel's chapters 2 through 7 are the Gentile section. That is, these are God's words through the prophet to the Gentile world. Chapter 1 was an introduction. It was written in Hebrew. It is, its audience was Israel. Uh, chapter, the end of chapter 7 to the end of the book is audience is Israel again. It's also in Hebrew. But this middle section, chapters 2 through 7, are written in Aramaic, the lingua franca of the Babylonian court and the ancient Near Eastern world at the time. And this section is particularly aimed at what the Gentile world must know, what all peoples of every tongues and tribes and nations and people must know about God's dealings with the world, specifically God's sovereign control over history. And in this section, chapters 2 through 7, a really interesting structure develops. And I have it for you on the slide. In chapter 2, we see that God reveals four kingdoms. God reveals four kingdoms. We saw those in the vision of the golden statue in chapter 2. Following that, we have in chapter 3, Gentile persecution. That is, the, the three young men are thrown in a fiery furnace. In chapter 4, we see that God judges pride. Nebuchadnezzar is in the crosshairs of God's humiliating judgment. And then in chapter 5, we see that God judges pride again, except in the next ruler, Belshazzar. And then in chapter 6, we go back to Gentile persecution. It is Daniel in the lion's den at that point. And then in chapter 7, we return to the four kingdoms. And they are the same four kingdoms, Rome, Medo-Persia, or sorry, I went backwards, Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome in the same order. This is a unique feature to Hebrew that kind of folds these things together in a repeated fashion. It sort of repeats from inside out, and the function of a structure like this is to highlight what's in the center. And what's highlighted here in the center is God judging pride. God judging pride. We'll get a little bit more specific. There's another way to word this structure in the next slide. We see in chapter 2, in the, go ahead and turn that next one. In chapter 2, we get a broad survey of history. Another way to think about those unfolding four kingdoms is to see the rest of world history, really the times of the Gentiles from the end of Israel's independence all the way through to the end of the world of human history until Messiah returns and sets up his kingdom. In chapter 3, we see God delivering his people, God delivering the three from the fiery furnace. In chapter 4, God humbles a Gentile king. It's not just the leveling of pride in general, but specifically it is the destruction of the pride of a Gentile king who thinks he's in charge of the world and one who is opposed at some level to God's people Israel. In chapter 5, we see the same thing, except instead of Nebuchadnezzar, And Nebuchadnezzar's pride being leveled, leading to a restoration, we see Belshazzar, the Gentile king, humbled by God, and he's dead. His humiliation does not result in a restoration. In chapter 6, we see God delivering his people again. uh, This is a chapter 6 and chapter 3, a reminder to all of Israel from the fiery furnace to the den of lions that God keeps his promises and he will keep his people. Any individual is not guaranteed of rescue from trial and persecution, but God rescues these to show that he has a purpose for his people, that God is faithful. And then in chapter 7, again, we get that broad survey of history, the unfolding of kingdoms all the way to Messiah's return. We're right smack dab in the middle of that structure, the highlight that God wants to bring about. And the the parallel to the humbling of pride or the leveling of a Gentile king is the simultaneous exaltation of God the sovereign, which is the theme of the book of Daniel. Let's talk about the timing of this a little bit. Most likely, Daniel chapter 4 happens somewhere in the neighborhood of 537 B.C., That is somewhere between the 30th and the 35th years of Nebuchadnezzar's 43-year reign. This puts this somewhere 25 to 30 years after chapter 3. So we just read chapter 3 last week. That seemed like seven days ago. And really what we're dealing with is some 25 to 30 years ago that chapter 3 happened with the three young men in the fiery furnace. 
At this point now in, da in Daniel chapter 4, Daniel himself is probably 45 to 50 years old. And think about the fact that Daniel has now been in charge of the magicians nearly three decades. He has been chief over the Babylonian wise guys. Now, how do we know this? There are a few clues to help us out. It's not stated in this text that, that this took place around 537 B.C., but we do know that Nebuchadnezzar's insanity was a period of seven years. We'll come to that in the next couple of weeks. And we have to leave sometime after his restoration for his majesty and his glory to be restored, and then for him to give this pronouncement we find in chapter 4, for him to give glory to God before the nations. That restoration has to take place. So maybe we put eight years plus on that time frame. Apparently, Nebuchadnezzar's significant building projects in Babylon are completed. Just a minute ago, we read verses 29 and 30. Nebuchadnezzar is proud of himself. He's satisfied with everything that he's built, and he cries out, Is this not Babylon the great that I've made? And so it would seem that the vast array of building projects that Nebuchadnezzar was historically known for in developing the great city of Babylon are completed at this point. He is sitting pretty. It would also seem that his enemies are subdued. The historical records put these events later in his reign. And then there are two historical witnesses that are significant, one in the 3rd century and one in the 2nd century BC, that both report an extended illness of Nebuchadnezzar's that kept him off the throne for a while. If those reports by secular, nearly contemporary witnesses are any indication um, of what we see in Daniel chapter 4, then all of these things would indicate uh, that this is later in his reign, probably 25 to 30 years after chapter 3. We're going to see in this text that Nebuchadnezzar exalts the God of Israel, first of all, by doxological summary, verses 1 to 3. He makes this pronouncement, Nebuchadnezzar the king, to all peoples and nations and men of every language that live in all the earth, may your peace abound. It has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. How great are His signs, how mighty are His wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. His dominion is from generation to generation. Full stop. This is the conclusion before we get to the story. Nebuchadnezzar is now going to backtrack and tell us how he got from point A to point B. How did he go from a Babylonian polytheist willing to acknowledge Yahweh like a knickknack on a shelf to saying things like these first three verses? And verses 4 to 37 are going to back us up and drag us through the whole dramatic, traumatic experience that Nebuchadnezzar faced to get him to utter this doxology. If you go down to verse 37, we see this theme from verse 3 bracketed. Here's the end of the chapter. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true, and his ways are just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. Verse 3 and verse 37 of this chapter is sort of the book ends of this traumatic event for Nebuchadnezzar sound a lot different than his polytheistic meanderings, his tip the hat to Yahweh statements that he's made up to this point. There is a theological transformation, and verses 4 to 37 are going to tell us how that happens. Verses 1 to 3 are just the summary of this doxology. It begins in verse 1 with the universal proclamation. Nebuchadnezzar the king to all peoples. This is a, a greeting, a, a proclamation, an announcement. Uh, there are some older manuscripts that label this an encyclical letter. That is, Nebuchadnezzar was intending for this to be published everywhere his empire was known. I'm going to say these things, scribes write it down, and send it to the four corners of my empire. It's pretty remarkable what he says here. He says, to all the peoples and nations and men of every language that live in all the earth. Uh, had Nebuchadnezzar circumnavigated the globe? Was he talking to the Philippines? I, did, he, did he know about Tempe? <laughs> it's pretty remarkable that Babylonian and Assyrian rulers were well known for seeing themselves as ruling the whole earth, even those places they had not yet explored. Why? Why? 
because everywhere they did go, they conquered. And they were sure that everywhere they would go, they would own that too. And so they just declared ownership, even in their inscriptions that archaeologists have discovered, that they were rulers of the earth. So that arrogance, global arrogance, comes out from Nebuchadnezzar, even in this greeting. But he says, everyone in the world must know what I'm about to tell you. And he says in verse 2, it has seemed good to me to declare the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. He says, it is seemly for me to declare. It, it is pleasing to me. And this word for pleasing or seemly carries with it a sense of obligation. That is, it is appropriate for me to tell you these things. It would be wrong for me not to. He is compelled here to testify. Nebuchadnezzar, by his experiences with the one true God, has been served the irresistible summons of the sovereign God of the universe, and now he must tell the world. And you know, at one level, he has to explain his absence from the throne. Where were you, Nebuchadnezzar? And what were you doing there? But more than that, Nebuchadnezzar has to give glory to God. He has been humbled, and he must give God the credit. What follows is no mere recollection of facts. This is a confession. This is a testimonial. Nebuchadnezzar himself is the evidence of God's sovereignty, both God's meta-sovereignty over all things generally, but also his meticulous sovereignty over the details of life and his own personal existence. God is in charge. And so Nebuchadnezzar must give glory to the God who was powerful to humble him and gracious to restore him. And so here you have a king publishing to the world his own folly and humiliation. And this is not the way of ancient Near Eastern kings. The records are scrubbed of the failures of the pharaohs. Similarly, Assyrian records are notorious for recording the successes of their kings and conveniently leaving out their failures. But this, what we have here, is, is the way the Bible portrays its heroes. Have you noticed that? Save the Lord Jesus Christ, the best of the best in the Bible. Their sins are on display. Think about King David, the man after God's own heart. How much ink is spilled in the Bible over his sins? And you think about the genealogy of the Messiah that had to come through David, that was promised to come through David. He would be like David in many ways, infinitely better. But how is David described in the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1? He is David, the father of Solomon by Bathsheba, who used to be the wife of Uriah. What's on display in the genealogy about David? His greatest failure? His sin? The Bible is honest about its heroes, and really the, the men in the Bible are not the heroes. They are the sinners in need of rescue. Nebuchadnezzar here is willing to put his own failures on display. In fact, publish them to every corner of his empire and announce it gladly. And what must he tell? Verse 2, the signs and wonders which the Most High God has done for me. The Most High God here is a clear contrast to the power of the Babylonian pantheon of deities. And Nebuchadnezzar makes it personal here. God has done these for me, and the word carries it with the idea of, for my benefit. And what are these signs and wonders? In Nebuchadnezzar's second year, he got the dream and its interpretation. In his fifth year, he saw Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego delivered from the fiery furnace. And then beginning in perhaps his 35th year, this second dream and its fulfillment. And this last sign and wonder was Nebuchadnezzar's own ruin. It was his own humiliation. He's not making himself the hero of his own story. He is eager to testify of God's humbling work. He's eager to testify of the fact that he survived God's humbling him and he received gracious restoration to God be the glory. 
So verse 3, here's his doxological declaration. And, and this, again, is the theme of the book of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar cries out, How great are his signs and how mighty are his wonders. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. This theme right here in the very center, the very apex, the crux of the section for the Gentiles. God is in charge. This comes up again and again in chapter 4. Look down at verse 25. Daniel's giving Nebuchadnezzar the interpretation of the dream, that you would be driven away from mankind and your dwelling place, that you would be with the beasts of the field, you'll be given grass to eat like cattle, you'll be drenched with the dew of heaven, seven times of time will pass over you until you recognize that the Most High is ruler over the realm of mankind, and he bestows it on whomever he wishes. And look at verse 6. In that it was commanded to leave the stump with the roots of the tree, your kingdom will be assured to you after you recognize that it is heaven who rules. And look down at verse 34. At the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven and my reason returned to me. I blessed the Most High and I praised and honored him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, including himself. And he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? Verse 37, now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise, exalt, and honor the king of heaven, for all his works are true. And his ways just, and he is able to humble those who walk in pride. This theme that God is sovereign is now known personally by the one who had charge of the earth in terms of human governance. How great are God's signs, how strong are his wonders. This is all a contrast to Nebuchadnezzar and his supposed strength. Signs here are those undeniably supernatural works that point to the reality about God and his message. Wonders are supernatural works that produce awe and astonishment. And those two go together often in scripture, signs and wonders. Look at the second half of verse 3. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and his dominion is from generation to generation. Whose kingdom reigns? Not Nebuchadnezzar's. Not the kingdom of Babylon. The gods of Babylon are not sovereign. They're not the ones who control the victors and the uh, victims of war. God is in charge of all of these things. The God of Israel, the most high God, the God of heaven is the sole source of power. He has no peers. He has no rivals. He is absolutely sovereign. This is the theme of the book of Daniel expressed here on the lips of a humbled pagan king. This sounds a lot like Psalm 145, 13. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and your dominion endures throughout all generations. And here on the lips of Nebuchadnezzar, these same words are uttered. God's kingdom is forever. It goes from generation to generation. It transcends all generations. This is a contrast to Nebuchadnezzar's own reign. Nebuchadnezzar's sovereignty, so-called, was interrupted by God. It could be set aside so easily, and how could Nebuchadnezzar truly be said to be sovereign if his sovereignty could be taken away? But not God's. You remember back in chapter 2 with the golden statue, it was told Nebuchadnezzar, after you will come, there would always be another kingdom and another kingdom and another kingdom until human history ends. But there is no after God. There is no end to his kingdom. There, there is no death, no assassinations, no surrenders, no transfers of power. This has significant implications for Nebuchadnezzar, no doubt. But this has massive implications for the Gentile world, for all the world, for, for human hopes. Who are we to trust in? Where should we put our hope and our confidence? The next administration? or the one whose administration rules all and transcends all and will never go away. There are implications for our eschatology, 
But God has already told us in Daniel chapter 2 the outcome of all human geopolitics. Uh, We must trust his plan and his kingdom will come when he himself brings it. There are direct implications for all of you aspiring tyrants. If you've set your hope and your ambition on ruling the world someday, there's an accountability coming from God. That is the flip side of Romans 13. Everyone who wields the sword will answer to God for how he wielded the sword. No earthly ruler escapes God's accounting. And we will be the best citizens under those ungodly rulers that we can possibly be. We will obey God rather than man, but up to that point, we will obey rulers and they will be held accountable. God is sovereign. Psalm 66.3 tells us that there is a day coming when God's enemies will feign obedience to him. They will pretend. In other words, they will be so forced by the rule of Messiah on the earth that they will say, yes, sir, even if they don't mean it from the heart. Messiah will rule the nations with a rod of iron. Psalm 2 encourages everyone to kiss the son lest he be angry. And the nations may rage against him, but they must make their peace. Psalm 110 reminds us that Jesus will have every enemy as his footstool. And Philippians 2 promises us, assures us, that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That means that Nebuchadnezzar and every other ruler there ever has been under the sun will not escape, will not escape God's accounting. There are implications for human pride as well. Everyone is humbled someday, one way or another. It's much better to be humbled by God in this life through faith than to be humbled the day you meet your maker out of faith. We ought not be offended at sovereignty, at God's sovereignty. We ought not be offended at his meta-sovereignty over all things generally, nor his specific sovereignty over the details in our lives. Every joy or trial we just sing falleth from above. These are good things from the Lord. We ought to embrace his absolute sovereignty. Nebuchadnezzar exalts the God of Israel, first of all, by doxological summary, this introductory song. And now in the unfolding of the rest of the chapter, we get to find out how did Nebuchadnezzar arrive at that doxology. We come secondly tonight to his personal testimony. Nebuchadnezzar will exalt the God of Israel by personal testimony. Look down at verse 4. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease. He starts to tell us how this all happened. Let's talk about giving testimony for a moment. Just as an aside, this is an extra sermonette within the sermon. Truth plus testimony is powerful. You, in fact, are an expert witness to the power of God, Christian. If you have been saved by the gospel you have firsthand knowledge of the power of the gospel. And the truth of the gospel, plus your personal testimony, is good evangelism. You get to tell the world how God saved a sinner, a particular sinner, you. Aside from all the tips and tricks and techniques that are out there for evangelism, and and there are many, I would suggest to you that you, as a trophy of God's grace, are an effective instrument because you are an expert witness. You have been saved by the gospel. You needed the gospel. You turned to Christ alone. You experienced life transformation. So tell people what God has done for you and include the doctrinal facts that the gospel requires. Right? Don't just tell a story. There's some circumstances that happened to me. I felt different one day. No, include the facts of the gospel. You want to include enough detail so that someone who's not a believer could hear your story and understand how to go to heaven. Telling a testimonial of God's grace in the gospel means including the gospel. Your story alone is not replicable, it's just an experience. But the gospel proclaimed with your life as evidence of its power That's good evangelism. And it's not scary evangelism, like, did I get the technique right? It's just, hey, friend, let me tell you what God did for me. 
Here, beginning in verse 4, Nebuchadnezzar tells his story. By the way, um, whether or not Nebuchadnezzar is regenerate or not is not the case I would want to make. I hope so. I hope to find out one day. He certainly says things that are informed better than he says before. And maybe that's as far as we could go. He says in verse 4, I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at ease in my house and flourishing in my palace. His house here is a designation of his residence and his palace, it's a word for palace or temple, was probably the, the royal residence where work was done, where people would visit him in his kingly function. Nebuchadnezzar was, is saying here that things were good at home and at work. He was at ease, that is, undisturbed, prospering, comfortable, content, secure. And he was flourishing. The word here literally means growing green. It was described, a word used to describe trees that were really doing well. This, of course, is a foreshadow for the content of the dream itself. Nebuchadnezzar will be the tree flourishing in the dream. But Nebuchadnezzar here is saying, look, I'm good. Life's good. We're all good here. Hashtag blessed. You know, God must be really happy with me. Things are going well. Think about Ecclesiastes 8.11. Because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, therefore the hearts of the sons of men are fully given over to do more evil. Do you recognize that in your own life? If there's not an immediate consequence to sin, the temptation is to not run to God, praise Him for His mercy but to take it for granted and, and be given over more fully to do evil. We ought to be terrified. You know, you can relax happily under judgment, judgment that will come like a thief when you least expect. It's like taking a nap in a really nice hammock stretched between two shade trees on opposite sides of the railroad tracks. Nebuchadnezzar was comfortable in the hammock, cool breeze, shade, over the train tracks. Judgment is coming. Beware the delusion of ease and prosperity. I want you to see an example of this in Psalm 73. You know, we get tripped up on this at times. We see the ungodly in the hammock and we envy Oh man, life is so easy for those guys. Look at all the stuff Nebuchadnezzar had. Look at the life she's got. That was the problem for the psalmist in Psalm 73. And in verse 1, he starts out the same way Nebuchadnezzar does. He gives the answer at the front end, then works through the problem. Verse 1, surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. Verse 2, oh, but I was in a bad way. <laughs> I was like a beast. Look at what he says in verse 12. Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They've increased in wealth. Surely in vain I have kept my heart pure. I've been stricken all day long, chastened every morning. There's a turn in verse 15. If I had said, if I had talked this way, I would, I would have betrayed your people. When I pondered to understand, then it was troublesome in my sight. Until, verse 17, I came into the sanctuary of God. A right view of God alters the perception that causes us to be envious of the wicked when they're rocking in the hammock. What does the right view of God include here in Psalm 73? I perceived their end. Surely, God, you set them in slippery places. and You cast them down to destruction, how they're destroyed in a moment. Look, destruction, judgment from God, rightly deserved, is coming like a thief. It's coming like a freight train on their easy life. Beware the delusion of the easy life. Look, and embrace the afflictions that God brings in his love. If you're a child, if you're a son or a daughter, then being disturbed from your comfort is a kindness. Psalm 119, 67, John Tried to preach one stanza of Psalm 119 a couple weeks ago and kind of talked about the whole thing. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. 
What kindness from God to disturb our comfort, to unease our ease? And if your idol is a comfortable, easy existence, and that's what you long for and pray for, and that's the altar you worship at, well, praise God when he disrupts that and knocks over the idols. Hebrews 12 speaks of the discipline of the Lord coming from God who loves his children. Evidence of his love. And if you're not a Christian, take Jesus' warning from Luke 12. Jesus said there, beware, be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. He told them a parable saying, the land of a rich man was very productive. He began reasoning to himself saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns. I'll build larger barns. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? Nebuchadnezzar here in verse 4 was at ease, prospering. He built big Babylonian barns, tore them down and built bigger ones. Verse 5. I saw a dream. This verse is grammatically abrupt. There have been connectors all the way through. There's no connector here, no conjunction. It just jumps out. A dream I saw. And we, we ought to read this like, I was at ease in my house. I was flourishing in the workplace. Everything was going great. No enemies prosperity. A dream I had. That's what it feels like in the Aramaic, I think. And it intensely frightened me. Every verb form in this phrase is an intensive form. The imaginings on my bed and the visions in my head intensely alarmed me, he says. This is a divinely given, terrifying encounter. And like chapter 2, you can't compare this to the scariest dream you've ever had. These two dreams from God to Nebuchadnezzar serve a specific purpose in redemptive history. They serve a purpose in God's sovereign dealings with the human geopolitical scene. These are really unique, rare. And by God's design, this dream, like the dream in chapter 2, had a relentless grip on Nebuchadnezzar's mind. He simply could not go on with life without an interpretation. And so he begs for one. Verse 6, So I gave orders to bring into my presence all the wise men of Babylon that they might make known to me the interpretation of the dream. Same story. Nebuchadnezzar goes to the wise guys. He called in the experts. Notice here that he only asks for the interpretation. He doesn't ask them here to prove themselves by revealing the dream. And I have to wonder if that's the effect of Daniel's chiefdom over the magicians. He has been head of the magicians in Babylon now for perhaps 30 years. Has that humbled the magicians a little bit? Have they stopped going beyond what they really are able to know? Has Daniel exercised some upper level management here? Are they more restrained? Are they kept from deceit? I don't know if Daniel's oversight has that effect. The other possibility is there's no death threat here, so they're not trying to weasel their way out of something by making up an interpretation. Whatever the case may be, Nebuchadnezzar doesn't threaten them. There are verbs in verse 7, when the magicians, the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners coming in, and I related the dream to them, and they were not being able to make the interpretation known. And the idea conveyed in these verbs is a, a progressive action, probably at intervals, different people coming in at different times, maybe in groups, maybe individually, and they, were, they kept coming in, and Nebuchadnezzar kept telling them the dream as successive individuals or groups entered his presence. And, and the idea in the original just is this tiresome train of people coming in without answers and Nebuchadnezzar explaining the dream. And it ends with this, phrase, and they were not making it known to me. Over and over again, they just weren't making it known. Apparently, no one dared venture an interpretation. 
Probably because as Nebuchadnezzar has told them the dream, it seems like a bad outcome. I mean, there's this great, magnificent, glorious tree, and it gets chopped down and destroyed, and the only thing left are the stump and its roots. And then there's a man like a beast wandering around like cattle eating grass. That just doesn't sound good. I don't know who it's about. <laughs> and, if it, and if it's about Nebuchadnezzar, I don't want to say it. Who wants to guess that outcome for the king? More importantly, without divine warrant for correct interpretation, these guys couldn't give any more than a guess anyway. And what would that be worth? They as a class have already been embarrassed by their guesswork. I'm sure if they had a union boss, he probably would have petitioned the government not to ask the magicians to do more than they were able. These are oppressive working conditions. In verses 8 and 9, we see Nebuchadnezzar turning to God. Not directly, he, he's turning to Daniel here. Look at verse 8. He says, but finally Daniel came in before me. Literally, this reads, until at last before me, Daniel. And I love the way Nebuchadnezzar is recounting this story. There is dramatic delay in bringing all four categories of the wise men, dramatic delay in the waiting for Daniel, and even dramatic delay in the way he's delivering this part of the story. This all helps to point out that all other helps were exhausted. At long last, the answer comes from Daniel's God. And Daniel is described in two ways here in verse 8. His name is Belteshazzar, according to the name of my God, and in whom is a spirit of the holy gods. You remember that Nebuchadnezzar named Daniel Belteshazzar, or had him named Belteshazzar. It meant something like, preserve the king's life, or, O oh, Bel, preserve the king's life. It was a, a way to sort of erase the memory of Yahweh worship for the captives coming over to Babylon, to scrub their theology by changing their names, to demonstrate his ownership of these slaves, and to rework their cultural worldview. And then he says, in you is the spirit of the holy gods. And it is conceivable, Aramaic like Hebrew could possibly be using the plural God to speak of the one true God, Elohim. But the adjective here for holy is also in the plural, and so most likely he is just saying holy gods. These are uh, not, a, not a specific res reference to the name of God or even the title of the one true God, but something along the lines of, in you, Daniel, is something divine, a spirit, a disposition that's otherworldly. And I need the answer. It is clear at this point in the story that Nebuchadnezzar is still a Babylonian polytheist. He is not humbled yet by this verse, uh, by the time we get to this verse. He is taking us through the story of his humiliation, and so he is accurately reporting his mindset at the time of calling Daniel in. He intellectually acknowledges that Daniel will have the answers, because of the God he serves. And look at verse 9. He, he addresses Daniel directly. O Belteshazzar, chief of the magicians, since I know that a spirit of the holy gods is in you and no mystery baffles you, tell me the visions of my dream which I have seen along with its interpretation. He calls him again Belteshazzar. He calls him chief or head of the magi. That is the group of magicians. And he reminds him, the spirit of the holy gods is in you. And then he says, no mysteries oppress you, literally. No mysteries are hard on you. No mysteries are too difficult for you to understand, Daniel. Now, why was Daniel in there last? Maybe it's the same reason that the keys, the car keys, are always in the last place you look. Because you stop looking after you find them. But I think this is intentional. On God's part, it may be intentional on Daniel's part. Maybe he just says, you know what, guys, Nebuchadnezzar's asking for an answer for a dream. Remember that one decades ago? Give it a shot. Maybe Daniel is putting on display the abject poverty of Babylonian wisdom. Or maybe he's detained with other duties. Whatever the case, God is certainly orchestrating this. And Daniel is on the scene last because God wants it so. 
Nebuchadnezzar's got to go through the whole train, the tiresome repeat of people coming in and not understanding in order to get to Daniel. In order for him to get to God's answer, God's truth clearly articulated. And so Nebuchadnezzar closes this setup of the story, the testimony of his dream by commanding Daniel, tell me the visions of my dream which I've seen along with its interpretation. The language is not quite clear here. Is Nebuchadnezzar putting Daniel on the spot to tell the dream or to relay the visions within the dream and explain them? Whatever the case may be, Nebuchadnezzar himself explains the dream to us. And we'll start looking at that next week. He'll report its interpretation. Unlike the chapter 2 dream, Nebuchadnezzar will actually see the fulfillment of this dream in his own lifetime. In fact, just one year after this, the nightmare will begin. That leads to an important question for us. We find out right here in this chapter that Nebuchadnezzar is going to get this warning via a dream from God, accurately interpreted by Daniel the prophet. He hears the message, he knows it's about him, and a year later, he's on his rooftop saying, look what I did by my might. How do you respond to truth? How do you respond to God's word? Do we hear what God says and walk away unchanged, unfazed? Arrogant, proud, walking on our rooftops. God's design in his word, God's gracious warnings of spiritual things for us are for our good. We need to hear, be humbled by them. Listen, you who have experienced God's love through the gospel, give glory to God who was powerful to humble you and gracious to restore you and then publish to the world your own folly and humiliation. Isn't that a great thing? You don't have to be the hero of your own story because you've come to grips with who you really are before a holy God, and you can, without harm to yourself and your psyche, say, I am a great sinner, and my Jesus is a greater Savior. And all glory to Him in it. Look, our shame and our humiliation is over the things that would have been destroyed in judgment. And God has been so kind to us to bring us to the end of ourselves that we might cling to him fully. And what mercy, what a kindness of God, what a kindness of God on display in Nebuchadnezzar's life. How many chances does this guy get? And how many opportunities did you get hearing the gospel before you believed. And since you believed, how patient has God been? All glory in the gospel, all glory in our own humiliation, all glory in the love of God for the undeserving. Nebuchadnezzar began us with a doxology. We're going to close our service with an a cappella doxology. The lyrics are on the screen. This will be our closing prayer. Praise God from whom all.